Disclaimer, please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk, then play at half speed. Thank you. This is why I joined the Space Marines. To boldly go where no man has gone before? Yeah, something about that, uh, something about that I like. Although these, uh, scouting missions are usually suicide missions. Remember what happened to our buddy Rob? Pour one out for that poor fool. That predator thing hunted him down like a movie podcaster. Didn't stand a chance. Hey, hey, hey. This is our first scouting mission, boys. Heads in the game. We are not gonna screw this up. Oh, yeah, we're good. Um, do those things look like eggs? I ain't never seen no eggs like that before. I think maybe we should report this back to command. Nope, nope, nope. Obviously they are flowers. Look at how one's blooming. You know, I don't know much about their botany, but, you know, that makes a little bit of sense there. Ooh, look at that cutie. Oh, look! They're all blooming. There's literally thousands of blooming flowers right now. <laughs> so beautiful. I should have sent a poet. Look at all that slime. Guys, look, the inside of this flower is moving. Ooh. Yeah, don't they uh, learn this in uh, the grade school? Isn't that called the stoma? I think it's called the stigma. No, you all are thinking the stigmata. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. They don't normally have, like, eight of them. Like spider legs. With little tiny teeth. Um, I'm beginning to think that this may not be a plant. Just gonna ignore that one and grab this one right here and take it back to the station. Yeah, I mean, you know, if this was dangerous, command wouldn't have sent us down here, right? I mean, I mean, leadership does have our best interests at heart. What's what's this thing over here, though? This is a. All right, well, let me reach down here and pluck this one on up. <laughs> I did not expect that. He should have picked up this one. Uh, guys, I just uh, did a little bit of extra reconnaissance. These are definitely face rape alien bugs. Up, off my leg, you. Uh, yeah, we should get out of here like right. Well, Tom, looks like you're stranded alone. Again. Guess it's back to the. Oh! So all you face alien rape bugs are awake. Alright. This is a predicament. What now, Tom? Remember your training. What do you do when surrounded by a thousand face rape alien bugs? Yeah, let's watch him. Do to understand that thing is out there ronald lacy and buckaroo bonsai can't be reasoned with plus the barons are dead clancy brown to highlander can't be bargained with christopher lambert to mortal Kombat doesn't feel pity just like kari hiroyuki tagawa to the art of war doesn't feel remorse <laughs> or michael bean and aliens doesn't feel fear <laughs> It absolutely will not stop. Get down. Until you take Jeanette Goldstein to Terminator 2. Judgment Day is coming to firepit.podbean.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh make their own fate and face the 90s summer blockbuster Terminator 2 Judgment Day. It's the vacation determination every Tuesday here at the Fire Pit. Hasta la vista, baby. Good evening, Buttshead listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit. I'm Tom, Space Marine name Corporal T Dog, and welcome to our 75th episode. Cue the part where I put in the applause and all the stuff. Yay! with laughter, tears, and lots and lots of death. It's nearly game over, man, as we continue 
on our vacation to termination, which has seen us battle across time, dimensions, realms, and whatever the hell we did in the art of war. Now, as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them on to this one. And now, to give us an idea of what we're watching and who we're watching, I turn things over to Josh. Hey yo! Hey yo! Thank you, Tom. Josh here. Space Marine name Lieutenant Mason. And last week we followed Kerry Hariyuki Tagawa from Mortal Kombat to the very air quotes flawed film of The Art of War, starring one Michael Bean. Even though they had like one scene together, it counts. They were in the same room. But uh I don't know. I, I forgot about that movie now because it was terrible but michael bean he was definitely one of the more entertaining parts of that film so tonight tonight we follow him to his second most famous role as corporal hicks in 1986's aliens the james cameron action sequel to the ridley scott sci-fi horror film and to give us a bit of a rundown and a little bit of trivia about the film i am gonna go ahead and uh, send a secret space message to dan thank you josh dan here Space Marine named Sergeant New Blood, and as mentioned tonight, we're watching Aliens, the sequel to the 1979 sci-fi horror film Alien by Ridley Scott. Tonight, James Cameron, however, takes the director's chair. So how do you keep the claustrophobic, intense, everyman horror vibe of the first film? If you're just going to add a bunch of macho space marines to the mix? Well, tonight we're going to find out. Uh, it had a release date of July 18th, 1986, so we just missed its birthday by about a month running time of 137 minutes a budget of 18.5 million and a box office return of 131.1 million to 183.3 million depending on your source so it made money just a bit yeah uh it has a rotten tomato score of 97 percent and an audience score of 94 percent. so welcome back good movies to the fire pit podcast it's been a while um thank you so good thank you <laughs> the drought is over it rains down in africa i'm not lying guys this is the, this is the, this is the highest one we've had since raiders which was our destination film last journey so yeah um, almost an entire month yeah Oof. so and an imdb score of eight out of ten so yeah uh this movie um made bank or uh, the studio i should say didn't have a whole lot of faith in the sequel um mostly because of the production woes everyone liked hearing about the production woes of some of the quote-unquote bad films we've seen but uh before we started recording today this this one was a lot like um the normandy invasion like it, it probably shouldn't have worked <laughs> Um, but somehow, some way, it did. Uh, and it did brilliantly. James Cameron has kind of a reputation on set of being um, a little bit of a bear to work with. He's a very big stickler for details. And um, he's, he's one of the best directors of our time. And he usually gets named right up there with guys like Spielberg and Kubrick and uh, other ones. Jesus but, Christ. Yeah. 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 And uh, Cameron's, like I said, he's a very big stickler for details. And uh, that definitely carried over into this film, which was amazing because I think this is only his third movie. I think he did like Piranha 2 and then he did The Terminator and then he did this. So swing and a miss on the first one, but you hit home runs on your second too. But uh, anyway, so James Cameron, they, they filmed most of the movie in um, Pinewood Studios in England. And uh, James Cameron did not get along with the English crew at all. They thought he was a poor substitute for Ridley Scott. Uh, they disliked him for the simple fact that he was American. He's actually Canadian. And not <laughs> British. <laughs> Way to get your racism wrong, guys. So they, they were openly hostile to Cameron and his then wife producer, Gail Ann Hurd, by claiming she wasn't a real producer and really only got the job because she was sleeping with Cameron. That's not true. She has a lot of really good film credits to her name. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bill Paxton later said the British film crew drove Cameron nuts with their indentured work ethic. And what they mean by indentured was uh, when you do an American production, you get to hire your own crew. Uh, it's, it's always, you know, depending on where you're filming, it's got, there's got to be rules. They got to be union or something like that. But you pick your own crew. Well, they filmed at Pinewood Studios and they had to use the crew that was already there. So um, they use what they call it. So they used the indentured work ethics. They would stop filming so they could have tea. They would stop filming so they could uh, leave early. Things got bad. The commentary of the DVD, actually, Michael Bean's making fun of them, saying they weren't used to working. 
<laughs> yeah. Things eventually hit a breaking point when Cameron clashed with a very uncooperative cameraman who refused to light the alien. That's the way Cameron wanted it lit. He wanted to set the light dark and to create atmosphere. And the cameraman was some old man or old school guy who wanted to kept going with really bright lighting to show off the uh, intricacies of the set. Finally, Cameron had enough of his shit, uh, told him he's fired, <laughs> threw him off the set, which then led to the whole crew walking out. Uh, requiring Gail and her to coax them all back in once they had cooled down. But uh, tension still remained. Dear God. So it's almost like the opposite of Blade, Blade Runner. Runner. I was thinking the exact same thing because didn't he come over and he was all like, these American crews aren't as good as the British crews. And they had the t-shirt war. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whereas this one's like, oh, those damned American directors. Like, fuck you, I'm Canadian. Get the fuck off my set. Dude, he even went to blows with James Horner, the guy who scores this film. The film was over schedule, over budget. James Horner barely had any time to put his score together. Things got so bad to the point where James Can- or James Horner would tell anyone who would listen, he will never work with James Cameron again. He later recanted and did Titanic and Avatar with him. <laughs> they, but they did to their defense. So they had patched things up by um, uh, the nineties when he was filming Titanic. Well, I think when you make several hundred million dollars per movie, you're like, okay, we can be friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well that, and, and James uh, to, to James Horner's credit, he's a very good score and you can say whatever you want about Titanic. That's the score to that film is awesome. Is very, very good. So oh, yeah. that was a good choice. That was a good choice to bury the hatchet and get the best guy for that job. I hate you, but I love money. So yeah, if we ever get to Titanic, there's more to that story because they buried the hatchet. And honestly, it was a story they both wanted to tell. He wanted to film the movie and James Cameron always appreciated the uh, the music of the original uh, Titanic movie. But I'll talk about that if we ever get to that film. Great story, actually. As I was saying, there was animosity on the set. People getting fired. People walking off. Um the British crew was openly hostile to both James Cameron and Gale and Heard. Uh, in their eyes, Cameron was a nobody who had not made a decent film yet. Uh, they hadn't seen Terminator because it hadn't come out in England yet. Cameron uh, despised the crew's lazy, insolent, arrogant behavior. And one of their few allies among them was production designer Peter Lamont. But after the long and difficult shoot, <laughs> Cameron addressed the crew by saying that the one thing that kept him going through it all, this is where you think he's going to give an inspirational speech. Absolutely not. <laughs> Cameron Cameron addressed the crew, the, the Pinewood studio crew by saying the one thing that kept him going through it all was the certain knowledge that one day I will drive out of Pinewood and never come back. And you sorry bastards will still be here. He then <laughs> left. <laughs> <laughs> He then left. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. And most of all, fuck you. Jason, you're decent. <laughs> Continue your thought, Dan. And, <laughs> I'm still laughing. So, uh, yeah. So he, and yes, he, as soon as he said that, he did leave. He never came back to Pinewood Studios, but he did later hire Lamont as a production designer on True Lies and even got in retirement work on, out of retirement to work on Titanic. <laughs> like, else. but but yes his 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 parting speech to the crew that that worked so tirelessly for him was fuck you fuck you and fuck this guy in particular <laughs> i'm james cameron <laughs> fuck you yeah uh, josh you're right it's the reverse of what happened on um blade runner although it sounds like uh cameron was more of a fuck y'all attitude towards the end whereas it seemed like ridley scott kind of uh yeah yeah well, it doesn't sound like the crew was very amiable, at least with the Americans um, on Blade Runner. They eventually it's like, yeah, you're right. We are assholes, too. We'll get this movie done. Yeah. Also, you remember the Blade Runner story? Like they all made T-shirts and hats, like kind of taking the piss out of that whole situation, like, you know, making light of it. Whereas um, this one, it just feels like everyone came to work and kept pissing in each other's coffee all morning. So <laughs> while they were drinking it. Yes. Yeah. But Cameron was still drinking it despite them. He was looking him in the eye while he was doing it, too. <laughs> so uh, a couple of the bits of trivia, though, the uh, in a story of, um, of course, you know, you guys have seen Office Space, right? Yes. Love that. OK. Movie. OK. So, you know, you know, the red stapler on the on what's his name's desk, right? Yeah. Um, okay, that didn't exist at the time that movie was made, but everyone kept asking for the red stapler. So they had to come up with one. Mm-hmm. Well, same kind of situation here. This movie comes out and many businesses wanted to buy power loaders to use as forklifts. <laughs> <laughs> They're legitimately calling up 20th Century Fox Studios wondering to know where they could get one. Um, 
Yeah, there's none to be bought. It's a combination of a stuntman working in the loader behind Ripley, who's moving the limbs with wires holding it up, and lots of miniature work. It's not a real thing. Okay, um, I uh, like when I was a kid, I wrote Universal Studios or whoever the fuck did this to get a like a hoverboard because I thought they were legitimately real. But <laughs> kids are fucking stupid. <laughs> yeah. So these are legitimate businesses asking for this. That is uh, pretty sad. By the way, I never got a reply to that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, the film wasn't expected to be a great success because of the troubled production uh, and the fact that it went over budget and also the fact that there's a sequel gap of seven years between this and Alien. The film was only given like a $17 million budget to begin with. It ended up with like 18.9 or almost $19 million budget. Everyone was really surprised when it grossed over $100 million worldwide gained Sigourney Weaver an Oscar nomination and probably saved 20th Century Fox Studios. They were in desperate need of a win at this point. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Like if it hadn't been for the success of this film, we might not have 20th Century Fox Studios anymore. Oh, no. Technically we don't. Yeah. Josh has a point. Yeah. You mean 20th Century Disney? (laughs) Well, okay. Right. (laughs) You're right. (laughs) We're all sad now. (laughs) We are. Bum, 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 bum. But, uh, eh, um... I found this to be nice. Michael Bean said that at the time of this movie, he was being made. Uh, he almost never got to play heroic characters like Corporal Hicks, uh, saying that people always look at him and see something wicked in his eyes and assume there's something wrong with him. Uh, but these days, he's arguably best remembered for playing heroes like Hicks and Kyle Reese in The Terminator, both for James Cameron. Coincidence or not, in the, uh, the James Cameron's next film, 1989's The Abyss, uh, he was cast as the villain. <laughs> also, a fun bit of trivia, not about this movie, but Michael Bean in, uh, was it uh, Terminator, was actually used as the inspiration for the original Solid Snake. He was. And he's also well-known for playing a villain. His Probably his third most famous role behind Kyle Reese and Corporal Hicks is, um, what's his name, in uh, Tombstone. Uh, oh! Um, yeah, he's, he's the bad guy in Tombstone. Uh, yeah. One I, of them. One of them. Didn't we just Josie recently Wales. watch a movie with him where he was the bad guy? Yeah, that was Art of War last week. That was the joke. Oh, right. <laughs> Damn it. The wound is still fresh, Josh. <laughs> You're supposed no. to be like... Yes, but see, this movie is supposed to be a palate cleanse of that movie, and we're getting, we're, we're getting out of that film and into, hopefully, a good one. My last two bits of trivia. Uh, Sigourney Weaver had initially been very hesitant to reprise her role as Ripley, She had rejected numerous offers from Fox Studios to do any sequels, fearing that her character would be poorly written and a subpar sequel could hurt the legacy of Alien. However, she was so impressed by the high quality of James Cameron's script, specifically the strong focus on Ripley, the mother-daughter bond between her character and Newt, and the precision in which Cameron wrote the character of Ripley, that she finally agreed to do the film. So, I want to know the story behind going to do Alien 3 in Alien Resurrection. Like, were you worried that a bad sequel would hurt the legacy of this film? I well, mean... She, well, she had a kid. Yeah, she had a kid who was going into yeah. college. So, yeah. Yeah. Money. Yeah. 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 Although, Money. the original concepts for Alien 3 are not bad. If we ever get to that film, that's a whole story in and of itself. A um, tragedy, for yeah. sure. And last but not least, everyone take a drink because here comes the Star Trek reference. Jeanette Goldstein's character, Vasquez, inspired the character Tasha Yar on... Uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. Goldstein herself was initially considered for the part, but she later went on to make brief appearance in Star Trek Generations. Bill Paxton's character Hudson inspired the character Guy Fleegman in Star Trek spoof Galaxy Quest in 1999, a movie we covered on this podcast, which also starred Sigourney Weaver. Nice. I kind of wish she had taken the role as Tasha Yar now, because maybe she'd still be alive as a character. Ah, but then we wouldn't have Worf. This is true. This is true. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, guys. One last bit of trivia. Uh, obviously, tonight, Bill Paxton's in this film. Tom will definitely mention that in his meta. But um, this is the second of the three major sci-fi deaths that Bill Paxton's had. Remember, Bill Paxton is the only person so far to have been killed by a Terminator, a Predator, and an alien in a film. So um, and we're going to have seen two of those by the end of the night. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're going to see Bill Paxton, unfortunately get killed by an alien tonight. And we did see him last summer. Spoiler alert, Tom. Yeah, we uh, did see him. Yeah, we did see him last summer get killed by a predator. So um, yeah, he's the only, he's, he's the only one so far to be killed by all three of the major 
sci-fi baddies. So we only got one more to go. Yep. Triple threat. Triple threat. <laughs> Triple threat. So <laughs> that's all I got for now. I've got more trivia as the movie goes on, as I always do, but I don't want to talk for too, too long because I've talked for long enough. So, Tom, uh, what's some of the meta on this film? Oh, boy, oh, boy, do I have some meta on this one. You, you kind of... Starting my Tom timer. Shut up. <laughs> okay, you, you did uh, swipe a bit of my thunder here and there, Nigel, but there's plenty of lightning to go around. So I think uh, I need a level set here. What is meta? Well, meta is basically who made this movie. So I know in the past I've been pretty broad in that definition. So I will be focusing from here on out on who went into making this movie, both behind the scenes and in front of the camera. And maybe based on what they've done in the past and present, we can have an idea of what we're in for. I will be averting reviews and critic scores because that's all post hoc. We can talk about that as uh, we go in. But for now... We are watching Aliens. Tagline, there are some places in the universe you don't go alone. Summary, 57 years after surviving an apocalyptic attack aboard her space vessel by merciless space creatures, Officer Ripley, played by Sigourney Weaver, awakens from hypersleep and tries to warn anyone who will listen about the Predators. And then they told her, no, you're thinking of a different film franchise. But the general info on this one, this is a sequel, as Nigel noted, to the 1979 film Alien, also starring Sigourney Weaver, uh, directed by John Carpenter at that time. But this one went under a new creative team. I didn't look up why they went uh, away from Carpenter when they went with this one. But I, I figured Dan might have some trivia about that as we go into the movie. Whereas Carpenter wanted to make this more of a horror film, the new directing team, creative team, wanted to make this more of a sort of, let's just say, Vietnam War allegory. And it definitely shows. So let's go behind the camera. We have some hit makers here for a change team. First off, this film was produced by Gail Ann Hurd. We've, of course, seen some of her films on this podcast and off the podcast. Terminator 2, which is coming around the corner a bit, and Armageddon. Um, she also um, produced Smokey Bites the Dust, which was part of the Smokey and the Bandit series of movies. But then she did Terminator after that, so Redemption. Dan noted in his trivia that there was some um, grief and um, snide remarks that she only got the job because she was married to the director. Actually, that was a reason they almost didn't pick her. But then she convinced them by saying she was the only person who could stand up to the director. And as Nigel noted in his uh, trivia, yeah, that definitely came in handy because this movie... Uh, was written by a host of people. Um, the story was written by David Geiler and Walter Hill, but the screenplay was written by and subsequently directed by one J.C. himself come down off his cross, James Cameron. You know, the guy that directed Titanic, uh, Dark Angel, you know, that TV show from 2002 that nobody remembers. He did get this movie, as Nigel noted, because of the success of Terminator and because of his screenplay for Rambo 2. Because let's be honest, uh, Piranha 2 was not exactly uh, going to look good on his resume. Uh, he's a director of a grand style, almost exclusively sci-fi and a bit of an asshole again as was noted not just in this film but other films he's done but you can't deny the results almost all of his films on imdb are a solid seven star range including battle angel alita i don't know if he had any say in it but whoever they picked to be in front of the camera choice we have an ensemble cast of wacky and lovable characters that i'm sure will all live to see the end of this movie and get that happy ending of course we have sigourney weaver paul reiser lance Hendrickson, b 
Bill Paxton, Michael Bean, Jeanette Goldstein, Cynthia Dale Scott, Rico Ross, the list goes on. Almost all of them solid character and professional actors before and after this with films ranging from Captain America, The First Avenger, to Saving Private Ryan, to A Bridge Too Far, and so on. As I said, this is a solid cast. We've already discussed Bill Paxton and Michael Bean who, um, how many films have they been in now that we've seen? Uh, this is what, Bill Paxton's second or his third that we've seen him on in this podcast? Uh, he was in Apollo 13, Predator 2, and this one. This is a three-peat for him. Man, Michael Bean, is this only a second? I feel like we've seen him in another thing. I think this is only the second time we've seen him. Okay. Yeah. I, I went more into Michael Bean's uh, work in our previous episode, uh, Art of War, Go back and listen to that episode. You don't have to watch that movie, though. But I think I'm just going to focus on Sigourney Weaver primarily. I may touch on Paul Reiser, but Sigourney Weaver plays Ripley. She is a returning actress on this movie and a returning actress on this show. Uh, go see our Ghostbusters 2 episode. Editorial amendment. Sigourney Weaver was also featured in our Galaxy Quest episode, which makes her a three-peat on our show. Congratulations, Sigourney Weaver, and apologies for the oversight. Welcome to the three-peat club. A stage and dramatic actress. She's one of the few actresses to have been nominated for an Oscar for performance in a horror movie, which I think was this movie. It was. Ah, uh, thank you, Nigel. Confirmation. We now know her as the queen of sci-fi, uh, with roles like Avatar and Ghostbusters. But before this, she was a stage actress. Uh, got her start in Annie Hall. Um, she'd actually gotten a bigger role in that movie, but she had a, a stage conflict. But uh, Woody Allen liked her stuff so much, her performance. Like, I'll give you a cameo. You know, I still want you in my movie somehow. And as the villain of this movie, not the alien. Paul Reiser as Carter Burke, the sleazy company man that sends them on their suicide mission. A performance actor and a comedian where he kind of plays uh, mostly neurotic everyman types. Mostly now known for dad roles where he was the dad in Whiplash, the dad in Life After Beth, the dad in Fatherhood. But before this, he kind of played asshole characters, such as in Diner and Beverly Hills Cop. So this was kind of on point for him. So in conclusion, we're looking at a film with a solid up-and-comer director on a tight leash with a solid cast of characters in front of the camera and all based on a solid, familiar property. So I think we can expect a pretty good film, at least a solid one. But that's what we can expect on the screen. Now I wonder what this did in the box office. So, Josh, how did this movie do in the theaters? All right. So, Aliens premiered, uh, as we already said, July 18th, 1986. It had a domestic gross of $85 million, at least according to uh, Box Office Mojo. It premiered at number one its opening weekend alongside movies named Vamp and Pirates. So it was a single-worded uh, movie premiere weekend. But anybody care to take a whack at the number two movie that weekend? July 18th, 1986. Yep. Out of Vamps and that other movie you meant, Pirates. Um... Vamp and Pirates was premiered at 11 and 14th, respectively. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, hmm. I got nothing. Yeah, I'm trying to think. 1989. What? 86. 86. Oof. Um, no, I'm blanking. It was a uh, sequel to a very popular movie. Five Will Goes West? No. That was Ali like 92. Aliens? <laughs> that premiered at number one, yeah. Well, you just said sequel to a popular film. That's what we're watching tonight. Uh, no, number two at the box office was The Karate Kid Part 2. Oh, oh nice. I forgot about that film. Yeah, it was on its fifth week of release. At number three was Ruthless People on its fourth week of release. At number four was uh, Back to School. That was a Rodney Dangerfield movie. And at number five was another movie we've covered on this podcast, Top Gun. Ooh, wow. That was on its tenth week of release. At number seven was Ferris Bueller's Day Off on its sixth week of release. And uh, not much else. The Great Mouse Detective was at number 12, and Psycho 3 was at number 13. 
Psycho 3. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a Psycho 3. Why? Because <laughs> <laughs> something's got to follow Psycho 2. Yeah, I mean, seriously. <laughs> Please do not ask stupid questions on this podcast, Tom. We do not have time for this. Yeah, Tom takes up the rest of the time. <laughs> the movie only works if you don't overthink it. Okay, yes. that's okay. I won't think about it any further then. <laughs> but um, let's see if you guys can guess the number one grossing movie for 1986. Top Gun. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Is it? Oh. Yeah, because yeah, he, he asked that question already. No. I, oh, I did, didn't I? Yeah, I can't remember which movie. We've seen another 1986. movie. 1986. Yeah, it was 1986. No, I wasn't. We didn't do the box office then. No. It, but yeah, you're right. I think, uh, God, what was that movie? I'm, I'm scrolling down the list. We did just recently cover a 1986 movie. Not Terminator. Not, um, it, oh, yeah, because yeah, it was Top Gun, but that was like a year ago. So Dan probably has really good memory about these things. Now it's been a recent one. Highlander. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, Highlander. But uh, number one that year was Top Gun. Number two was Crocodile Dundee. And number three was The Karate Kid Part 2. Number four was Back to School. And at number five was Aliens, the movie we get to watch tonight. So it was a interesting year. A lot of good movies came out. Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Stand <laughs> By Me. Oh, ah, another uh, podcast movie. Yeah, that uh, was at number 13 for 1986. Short Circuit was 21. Rocky IV was at 24. Oh, another movie we need to get to at number 23 was The Fly. Ooh, I've seen that in theaters. We need to get to that one. We definitely need to get to that one. But uh, there was a lot of good movies that year. Ooh, number 54 was Howard the Duck. Could we never get to that movie? (laughs) No. Space Camp, number 76. Ooh, I do want to. But I'm just reading a list now. That's got to be exciting for the listeners. I unfortunately cannot. uh, I don't have enough material to go on for 10 minutes. So I'm just going to go ahead and segue us on to expectations. So, uh, Tom. Yeah. I know you've seen this movie before. So tell us about that. Tell us about what you're hoping to get out of this viewing. Well, Josh, of all the no times I've seen this film, every time I haven't seen it. Has just you been... haven't seen this film, have you? I have never seen Aliens, with the exception of maybe like five seconds when it was on TV, but I was not allowed to watch it because I was too young and my parents shooed me out of the room. Uh, no, the closest I've ever come to this movie are the toy commercials. <laughs> it's the like, Space Marines, Aliens. Like you had the power loader and everything else. I love those toys. I did not have those toys. I wanted those toys. It's funny that a rated R film would get toys, but that ah bit of bit of trivia for that. The toys were for a uh, proposed cartoon show that never took off, or that never got approved or greenlit or something like that. Just why the toy characters of like Apone and Hicks and Ripley look a lot different than they did in the uh, movie because they were based on their cartoon characters. I think it was just because of cheap toy makers like they did with the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves toys. Like, hey, we got a whole bunch of old like Lex Luthor and Superman toys from the, you know, superpowers. Let's just like repaint them. Yeah, they they did that a couple times in the mid 80s with toy lines just to get you back on your expectations. But RoboCop got a toy line and an animated series, even though that mo- both of those movies are very rated R. Um, yeah. uh, Terminator got a toy line even though those movies are rated R. Uh, Aliens got a toy line, rated R film. Then they later added the Predator to the Aliens toy line, rated R movies. Uh, And then there's another one I'm thinking of that was a rated R film that got a toy line, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. But yeah, yeah, that was like a thing. Oh, Rambo. Rambo got a toy line in a a cartoon. So Rambo. Uh, The 80s. Such a special time in history. It really yep. was. Like, but anywho, on with your uh, expectations since you haven't seen this film. No, I have before. not. No, my only exposure. I mean, I. When was the first time you've actually seen this film? film? I, like, tell us about that. The first time I've seen this. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Josh likes to take the joke and just see how long he can stretch it, uh, smother it just until it's dead. <laughs> and then we all take turns beating it. No, the. I I mean, I know all the beats of this movie. I know the lines like, game over, man. Game over. We know how this movie goes. I played so many Aliens games and spinoff games that I practically have seen the movie just by osmosis. But for me, 
I've always wanted to see this film. This and Alien. Because I've seen Aliens 3. I've seen Aliens 3. I liked Aliens 3. But that was because I was but a teenage Tom. And I had not been exposed to the good ones. So, finally getting to see Aliens. I'm excited for this movie. Come on, early James Cameron. Guns, explosions, aliens, flamethrowers. Ripley operating a giant mech suit. Frick yes, I am ready for this. I have saved myself for this moment. I am ready and willing to go, guys. Josh, how many times have you not seen this movie? Oh, man, I am naked, oiled up, and ready to go, too. Wait, what? And that's it for tonight's show, so... (laughs) Catchphrase! (laughs) Oh, oh, God, this movie takes me back. Um, I remember... Back in the old VHS rental days, it's like I was always scared of watching these movies. And one time, I think I showed interest in a uh, horror film. I think it was Terminator 2. My dad finally sat me down to watch that. Um, I wasn't much older than my son, like single digits, early double digits. And uh, we rented all three of them. I remember being scared to watch these movies. Uh, We just marathoned over a weekend. Alien, Aliens, and Alien 3. Damn. And uh, I think Alien 3. When did that come out? Oh, that was early 90s, wasn't it? 1991. Yeah, so 91. So yeah, I would have been like eight, eight or nine. Because that just came out or just like was a year or so out. But uh, I remember sitting down and watching it. And I remember being like, okay, this is this is it, Josh. This is, this is your indoctrination into the big leagues. You're watching rated R movies now with your dad. Let's do this. <laughs> um, I remember watching them with the lights on. <laughs> But I, I loved these movies when I was a kid, and I've grown to watch them a handful of times growing up. I think it's been a few years since I've seen this one, though. I don't know why, because it's such a good movie. Yeah, I just I, I know I'm going to enjoy the film tonight. I'm curious to see what, uh, basically what I go through adult eyes. I don't know how when the last time I've seen this movie was. It could have been a long time. But at the same time, it could have just been a little while ago. I don't know. I watch a lot of movies. I haven't watched it in recent memory. But uh, no, it's. I'm looking forward to watching this movie tonight. I've been excited about this all week, writing the skit for this episode. I was just like thinking about the movie again. I'm like, oh, this is going to be so awesome. I remember playing with those toys. I had a neighbor who had them. And I still think the 80s was a wonderful time. Rated R movies, having a toy line. Come on, seriously. It, was it a- really doesn't get better than that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it does, but it's definitely a unique time yeah that's 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 for sure but no i remember loving the aliens predators and all that other stuff like love them or hate them the alien versus predator movies i'm not acknowledging they were good movies but i had fun watching them um i've always liked predators i've always liked aliens i've always liked that entire universe if you want to call it that yeah i'm I'm looking forward to tonight's movie i really don't have much more to say than that Dan, what about you? You've never seen it, right? Oh, God, no. Yeah, I've seen it a bunch of times. Um, I actually got to see it in theaters uh, in 2016 for its 30th anniversary. Ooh, nice. Yeah, I love this movie. But I have a hard time deciding which is better, Aliens or Alien. They're both very, very, very good movies. I'm so glad we're watching this tonight. And I'm so glad that it's the movie we're watching before Terminator 2. Because... Terminator 2 and this film, I think, are two of the best sequels of all time. Like, they really take care of their uh, first film, and they up the stakes without nullifying the threat in the first movie. So that's what I love about it. But um, I don't know. I'm really looking forward to watching it. I'm looking forward to Tom watching it, because he's, I can't believe he's never seen this film. I mean... You're such a big, you know, stickler for good films, seeing good movies. And you've gone to see a bunch of movies like this at Studio 35 and, and whatnot in Columbus. And I, I'm so just befuddled. You've never seen this film in all these years. But he's seen it like a dozen times, though, right? Where is he getting this? I, I, what is this? Are you thinking of alt first? Is this? Is... Yeah, must be. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, My expectations are um, pretty high because, like I said, I love this film. I think tonight I'm going to look for Cameron's attention to details because he's such a stickler for it. Because I've read about like the production on Titanic and the production on The Abyss where he was just kind of like a taskmaster or a slave driver and just kind of a 
asshole on set trying to get everything perfect. And I didn't know that he started that way, you know? So like, no, they're like, no, he's a pain in the ass to work for on Terminator and aliens too. And I'm like, Oh wow. Okay. Oh, so if you want to hear asshole stuff, when we get to the abyss, you've got some trivia, my sir. Oh, oh yeah. Boy. Yes. Yes. And same with Titanic. So anywho, uh, I'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing this film. I, I, my expectations are pretty high and I'm just excited to sit for Tom to see it for the first time. Mm-hmm. And then to kind of start us off on the merge thoughts for one, I, I kind of like that Cameron decided to buck the trend of making the sequel exactly like the first one, only maybe slightly higher budget and said, no different entire movie. I'm going to throw Marines into this and see what happens. I thought that was a brilliant, daring choice. Oh, yeah, very very much so. I know, like, Cameron is just... I don't know where I was going with this thought. I love James Cameron. That's a good start. I mean... Oh, yeah, that's where I was at. Okay. It seems like James Cameron's um, arrogance and asshole on set is deserved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We talked last week about um, Wesley Snipes being an asshole to work with. But it's just like, dude, you've done, like, three movies, and they were okay. (laughs) Stop. (laughs) You've done three movies. One of them was good. <laughs> but it seems like Cameron is one of those guys who is an asshole to work for, but the motherfucker knows how to make movies. Like, love it or hate it, Avatar, Ava- like, I, I always argue, I always argue the point. Avatar, the story was the weakest part of that movie, but it wasn't terrible. Like, yeah, it was kind of a cookie cutter story, but overall, I think the atmosphere um, and attention to detail and everything in Avatar made that movie such a freaking huge success. Like, I still think it holds up pretty well to today, having recently rewatched it. Same thing with Titanic. That movie still holds up. Whether or not you like the movies or not, I mean, they are still really well-made movies. I would argue that they they kind of lean very heavily on the technical aspects of the film, not the stories. Because Titanic was also just a very weak story. generic story but it's yeah. like i think james cameron leans heavily into the storytelling and not so much the story because you can have the shittiest fucking story in the world but if you have somebody who knows how to tell a story they can make it interesting like you can have somebody uh read an amazing story like star wars if they tell it horribly you're not interested like i honestly think last week's the art of war i could see elements of a story that they wanted mm-hmm. but everything about that movie was terrible but I think the elements of the story could have been a good story if executed properly. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I, I'm not disagreeing with you on any of that. But I think like the way James Cameron really, he's like, he pays so much attention to everything else. We talked about it a while back. Simple stories. Remember that? Like Jaws? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Stand by me. We had that whole discussion on simplistic stories. I think he leans heavily into that. Keep the story simple, but focus on your storytelling elements. I'm curious to see what his storytelling elements are in this one. Cause it's, it just occurred to me like his answer to Rambo, which is a very simple, like claustrophobic film about a man trying to survive and turn it into guns and explosions. And then he pivoted over to aliens. Like, Hmm, it worked once. Well, it worked twice, but he didn't do Rambo too. Yes, yeah. He, he did. didn't do he, Rambo. He, he wrote Rambo too. He did not direct it, but he wrote it. Oh, okay. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. I, I did not know that either until I was looking up meta. So Today I learned. Um, mm-hmm. Although that is a film I'd love to get to someday. Yeah, Rambo I've never too. seen it. Um, so also, yes. So but again, I'm, look, I'm looking to forward to also seeing what story he puts into this, or if it's just going to kind of lean on the Marines are outnumbered and outgunned by aliens. How will they survive sort of thing? Which I'm not going to complain if that turns out to be all it is. I mean, sometimes you just want guns, bombs, and nuke it from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. Yeah, I think he does a good job in this film. And I'll get to it when we get to final thoughts. But I think he does a really good job in this film of like keeping the tension from the first one. Because the first one, Alien, is just a single alien. But it's on that ship and there's no escape from the ship. And they're all alone on it. And they're trapped in the ship with that alien. So the, the first one has this really like claustrophobic kind of a feel. And of course, none of them are soldiers in the first one. And it's not like a, a, a regular, it wasn't like a science fiction movie that was made at the time where they're like space scientists, like in Star Trek or space warriors and smugglers, like in uh, uh, Star Wars or whatever. Nope. They're basically space truckers in the first mm-hmm. alien film. It would be no different if they just took the alien and put him on a 
cargo hauler in the middle of the ocean instead of space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, they're not soldiers. They're not trained. The only one even in the movie that has any kind of quote military experience is their captain Dallas. They mentioned that that's where he got his piloting skills. Uh, but th that's what the tension is. So then in this one, like he's like, well, I'm just going to put a bunch of space Marines on the planet with guns. And they're like, oh, well then the alien aren't going to be scary anymore. Mm. Yeah. I think he does a good job of keeping them scary. Yeah, yeah, very good job of keeping them scary. Because you do watch the first one, you're like, man, if only they had a gun, they'd be okay. Nope. Nope. <laughs> so, yeah, but we'll get into that more as we after we watch the film. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I I love this movie. It's I think it's one of the, my favorite movies of all time. And it's definitely one of my favorite James Cameron movie. Honestly, it's like one of those things. Um, I, I can go into a James Cameron film that he's directed. And I know that there's going to be a lot of attention to detail. I'm pretty confident. I could walk into a film and not think it's going to suck. So I, I, uh, I have faith in our Lord and savior, James Cameron, but, uh, that's what we think about this film. Did you guys have anything else? Uh, no, no, but I think someone else might have maybe a little input about some of the other people that have also seen this film and had thoughts about it. But who could that someone be? Josh, is it you? Uh, no, 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 it's not me, thankfully, because I had to give the quiz last week. That's right. And I lost the quiz last week. So that means... Dan! Dan! What? You have quiz this week. No, I don't. Yes, yes you, do. you do. No, I don't. <laughs> the quiz has become a punishment it's fun though no it's fun it's fun actually yes i do have quiz this week and uh i've uh got some reviews here some interesting reviews from imdb one of them has aged remarkably well um <laughs> i'm looking forward to this one i want to track this actual user down and just i want to feed him a plate of crow Anyways, so uh, typical rules. Uh, I'm reading IMDb reviews. Scores one out of ten. You guys pick a number, one through ten. Who's ever the closest without getting over within two gets the point. Obviously, Price is Right rules. And if you get it right on the money, you get two points. And you can't pick the same review as the other person. Yeah, you, yeah. So, you know, if Josh says ten or two, Tom can't say two. All right. So, uh, Tom, we'll start with you. Good choice. <sighs> To balance the reviews, I have to call this movie highly overrated. Action and lines are highly cliche-like, and many of the features are just too unrealistic. Who said this, uh, review? His name is Thulmanden. 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 Could you repeat it once more? <laughs> to balance the reviews, I have to call this movie highly overrated. Action and lines are highly cliche-like, and many of the features are just too unrealistic, even for a fiction film. I don't know what he was expecting. Well, I feel like since he's trying to balance it out with that, everything else was pretty solid. So I'm going to say this is a nine. Really? Yeah, I think he uh, he's trying to balance it out, but everything else is just going to be gush. I legitimately was thinking you were going to go one on that one, and I was totally planning to go two. I think I'm going to go, since you're going that high, I'm going to go three. Josh is the closest. It's a five-star review. You know what? Balance. Yeah. Now that you say it. Yep. 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 All right, Josh, this one is going to you. Stirring and superior sequel with plenty of thrills, intrigue, suspense, disgusting special effects, and lots of blood and gore. I'm going to go a nine on this one. Damn it. Uh, I'm going to go eight. Tom, right on the money. Eight star review. Boom, baby. Oh, nice. I almost went ten. I'm glad I did. I almost went eight. You should have, but you didn't. <laughs> I'm okay. You're winning. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so Josh has got one. Tom's got no, two. All right. Uh, Tom, next one is to you. A film that shows how extremely brave women are. One star review. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tom's turn. Seven star. I'm going to go eight. Tom is closest without going over. It's a nine. Wait, I said eight. Oh, wait, wait. Seven. I'm sorry. I thought Tom said eight. You said seven. Yo, Josh got that one then. So that's a nine star review. Uh, we are tied up for now. Okay, here's my favorite one, Josh. <laughs> this is a good one. Can't wait for Ridley Scott to return. This one kills the Alien franchise. This review was written before Prometheus came out. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said this one's aged well. Um, I'm going to go three. I'm going to go one. 
Tom, right on the money. A one-star review. Boom. Oof. I know my shit reviews. All right. If Tom gets one point in the next one, he wins. If Josh gets it right on the money, we tie. All right. So, Tom. The first Alien film is considered a classic, but I don't particularly like it. The sequel is also considered a classic, and I like this one even less than the first. At least the first one had tension. This one's just a shoot 'em up. Good. Fuck this guy. Three star. Let's go two. Tom's doing trivia next week. It's a four star. I almost went one above. <laughs> but you did until so I win. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun with that. And uh, the tiebreaker question was the movie that destroyed the franchise forever. Ten. One to two. <laughs> Fuck that guy in particular, too. Yeah, like the one that destroyed the franchise forever. I'm like, did you not watch three or Alien Resurrection or any of the Alien vs. Predator films? Yeah. Fuck that guy and Tom play the music. Welcome back to the fire pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and space airman, Tom. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, come on back, space marines. Yeah, our sensors show no life in those tunnels. You are free to go in unarmed and unarmored. I do see some space eggs just around the corner? That just sounds like a perfect time to cook up some space omelets. Mm -mm -mm. And thank you for cooking it up with us here at the fire pit. We just arrived in orbit of the destination of our vacation determination and are just about to make landfall on our final film, Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Make sure you bring some fly swatters though, as I'm told there are some bugs along the way. And also bring a hazmat suit because they have acid blood. You know, xenomorphs and aliens, and that's where I'm going with this. But speaking of bugs, let's see how our team's handling the squashing of the bugs of their own planetary excursion. Tom! Tom, wake up! It will not stop until you're all... Wait, what? Huh? What? What? Oh good, you're awake. Uh, wait, what, what? What's going on? Something is on the loose all in the ship, and it's killing everyone. Wait just a minute, who the fuck is that? Who the fuck are you? Where the hell is Josh? Well, he died. Yeah, we found him in the cargo hold with a huge hole in his chest. It was disgusting. Oh, well, that's Lieutenant Josh over there. Uh, he's hanging out with us now. It's all good. Josh was a late addition to the crew anyways. Never quite fit in. I do suppose. I mean, they both do sound awfully lot alike. So I don't see myself getting confused by this predicament at all. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, so an alien thing, huh? Yeah, it killed most of the crew. But for some reason, it ain't come in the infirmary yet. Yeah, I saw it earlier. It just kind of walked on past me. So is it just us then? More than likely, I haven't seen another soul in a couple hours. Well, let me just go ahead and poke my head out into the hallway and take a look-see. All right, well, uh, yeah, I don't see any- What the fuck? Oh, that. Yeah, you see that a dozen or so times, you kind of get numb to it. Why is the alien sitting at the door looking at you? What are you making googly eyes at it for? Just come on, shoot it! <laughs> yeah, we ran out of ammo a long time ago. Oh man, game over, man, game over. Oh my lord, what's that zit going on your chest? Oh, I, don't, mm, I don't know, it's just uh, some Arbor and I had some Taco Bell earlier. Oh, 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 mama! Oh, oh, it is everywhere! Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, this is gonna hurt, huh? Yes. Well, you know, when you say it like that, it does make perfect sense. No need to think on it further. <laughs> oh, yeah. Huh. So, 
There's an Easter egg mentioning Tyrell Corporation in Alien 2, I think. And the Marines mention other extraterrestrial species in Aliens. And imply that this is not their first bug hunt. Hmm, and Predator is often shown to coexist in the Alien universe. Does that mean Blade Runner and Alien and Predator exist within a fourth yet identified universe? A fourth universe that also involves bug aliens? Blade Runner slash Alien slash Predator slash Starship Troopers combined universe confirmed? We'll find out. But if you want to combine your movie journey recommendations with our own, or if you want to combine your money with our bank account for an advertisement, or if you want to combine a bunch of letters into a whole email to say how amazing we are, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc and c at gmail.com just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line as well as the purpose of your email whether it's to shout out an ad a shout out at us for getting something wrong a shout in excitement at us for getting something right or just a shout out at something you like in general and send it on over from there we'll read it send it to our good friend burke who works for the company but is an okay guy defend it in a hearing against a group of corporate lawyers representing a multi-planetary conglomerate in what is clearly a monkey trial <gasps> and never respond. It was either that or we go on to a hostile world and basically rip off the entire plot of Forbidden World, which aliens totally did not do. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I at gmail.com Hey, hey, yo, yo, yo. What's that? New kid from orbit? Only way to be sure? Oh, well, if that's what you insist. Oh, they just don't know how hard it is for us in the Space Air Force. Oh my god, the things we do for college. Well, I'm just going to bask in the irradiated glow of a job well done. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. Ah, uh, the things I do for a film degree. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Somewhere out there, an alien. Beneath the pale moonlight, Josh can't get a cue going to follow Tom's lead. You both are idiots. You know what? Hang on. Let me turn off my lights here. If I'm going to be watching Aliens, I need to get in the proper... Ah, there we go. All the lights are off. I've got my my security blanket. You know, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that, too. I'm going to go shut off my lights, and we're going to do this proper. All right, already scared. I'm turning the lights on. Oh, my God. Scary text. So, fun fact here. Uh, three different types of smoke were used uh, at various scenes in this film. One of them is no longer allowed to be used in movie productions where they're actually filming with people. Is this one of those smokes? <laughs> I don't know which one it is, but its they're not allowed to use it anymore. Sigourney Reaver was supposed to play dead in this scene. She may actually be almost dead. I'm Burke. I'm Carter Burke. I work for the company. Don't let that fool you. I'm really an okay guy. You have a popped collar. If popped collars have taught me anything, you, you were a douche canoe. I feel like this is a Chekhov's gun. <laughs>
That's not a gun. That's a power lifter, Josh. I really want one of those. I'm going to see if they're real. Call 20th Century Fox. You just got to place an order. <laughs> Are there any species like this hostile organism on LV-426? No, it's a rock. No indigenous life. Did IQs just drop sharply while I was away? Oh, let's tell you about 2020s, ma'am. Now, how many different ways do you want me to tell the same story? Look at it from our perspective, please. I can't fit my head that far up my ass, sir. <laughs> so she was in that thing for 57 years. Unbelievable. Oh my god, my student loans have got to be ridiculous. I feel like I should have a witty comment for that, but I can't think of anything. I think I need another white claw. <laughs> I think the reason you can't come up with something witty is because of the white claw. Yeah, you might as well drink paint thinner at this point. You guys throw me at the wolves, and now you want me to go back out there? Ripley, you wouldn't be going in with the troops. I can guarantee your safety. Every time somebody says that, somebody dies horribly. Sure wouldn't mind getting some more of that Arcturian boom thing. Remember that time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the one that you had was male. <laughs> <laughs> Progressive! 1980s, Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton's my favorite part of any movie he's in. Just think, in three years, he's going to be filming Slipstream. <laughs> Put me back in! Put me back in! <laughs> You know what? These special effects still look better than anything that was in Art of War. Low bar. X, meet me at the south lock. We're coming in. Roger. He's coming in. I feel safer already. You guys are on comms. I can hear you. <laughs> well, well, then let me say it louder. <laughs> Physically, she's okay. Borderline malnutrition, but I don't think there's any permanent damage. Come on, we're wasting our time. There's that marine sympathy right there he can't shoot it and he can't fuck it he has no idea what to do with it hey palm we can't have any firing in there i want you to collect magazines from everybody is he fucking crazy hey, what the hell are we supposed to use man harsh language flame units only i want rifles slung sir i just do it sergeant and no grenades that's dumb this is such an officer decision <laughs> It is really it is uh. such an off. He really does pay attention to detail. I say we take off and nuke the entire site for morbid. It's the only way to be sure. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on one second. This installation has a substantial dollar value attached to it. <sighs> they can bill me. You're still paying off the last thing you blew up. Well, I believe Corporal Hicks has authority here. Corporal Hicks's. This operation is under military jurisdiction, and Hicks is next in chain of command. Am I right, Corporal? <laughs> E4 is in charge. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> fuck, 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 fuck. I'm on the plus side. They just took care of those aliens. I hate everything about today. <laughs> <laughs> My mommy always said there were no monsters, no real ones. Well, your mom's dead, so what does she know? Yeah, Mama's got a gun this time, bitch. Like, why the fuck didn't I have one of these on the Nostromos? Because they were space truckers. They had flamethrowers and shotguns and thing. Yeah, but they were scientists. <laughs> Sci <laughs> <laughs> they use elevators now? <laughs> God, I hate everything about today. Not bad for a human. Oh, Bishop, don't go all to pieces. Boo! Boo! He half-assed that line. <laughs> oh, boo! For those listening, at this point in the movie, Bishop was ripped in half by the alien. There's not even a quarter of him left over. And my compatriots are making this more painful for us than it is for him. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed Tom didn't correct me and say Chekhov's rifle. No, it's a Chekhov's gun. You got it right. That's why you weren't corrected. Oh, no shit. <laughs> After all these times, Tom, I got it right. <laughs> Congratulations, Josh. Broken clock. I can't help but think that this face hugger thing wouldn't be a big deal if everyone would just wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> and now, back to the episode. I would love to see James Cameron do a Batman movie. I don't know. You know, you're kind of probably right. He'd probably like want to do his own like really epic twists on it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like how uh, Rian Johnson, J.J. Abrams wanted to do their twists on Star Wars. 
Yeah. Well, I'm also worried about like him being Cameron and all. He would, to help motivate his actor, actually kill their parents. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that was Aliens. So uh, we're going to mix things up a little bit tonight. And since uh, Tom is the only one of us who hasn't seen the movie, Tom, you, you get to uh, tell us what you thought about this movie. Well, I'm going to start by saying I like this film. This was worth the journey to get to. Was it worth the wait? I can't say that it really was because I think I've overhyped it for myself at this point. Um, You can tell this was Cameron's early big budget film just in the way he shot a lot of uh, some of the stuff. Some of the sets on the planet clearly look like sets the rocky terrain of i can't remember what planet they were on lv426 yeah it, it, you could tell that those rocks were plastic um with a lot of spray paint on them in terms of cinematography a lot of the shots weren't as tight as they could have been especially in the earlier parts when like they're storming the base and all that's like they definitely showed more than they should have considering how tense the scene was That said, once they got to the alien stuff, then things really picked up. You could definitely tell he knew what to do when it came to heavy claustrophobia. And maybe that was on purpose. Like, it's why? Because there's a lot of space to work with. I think it could have been better. Definitely compared to later movies he's done. He definitely refined his talent. But... I'm just going to start with that right now, picking the cinematography apart. I think it could have been better, but it wasn't terrible. It definitely miles above, say, Art of War or any of those films we've seen so far. I'm going to stop there because I could go on for a while more, but I'd like to get your input, Dan, as someone who's seen this more recently and uh, what are your thoughts on this rewatch for you? I love how Cameron has this ability when his storytelling to make you think for a second the characters might be safe and then immediately remind you they are absolutely not safe in any way, shape or form. Um, this is one of his earlier films. The movie before this one that he made was The Terminator. And I go back to that scene where Sarah Connor's in the police station and she's trying to get some rest. And the police captain tucks her in or puts his jacket over her and says, you're in the safest place in the city. There's 50 cops in this building. And then literally 10 minutes later, the Terminator mows through all of them like Mm -hmm. they're nothing. And this movie had a lot of that, too. Like this movie had a lot more scenes of where you just the characters are taking a second to breathe. Like, okay, okay, the worst if it's over. And then their plane explodes. (laughs) It's it's like, no, no. (laughs) <laughs> you, at no point in time were you absolutely safe. So I love that about this film. I love that, like I said, they take the badass, awesome space Marines and still make the aliens really, really scary and build the tension and make them really creepy and just nullify every advantage the Marines have. Um, I love that, like that uh, Hudson's telling them like, oh, we got these guns and these guns and these missiles and these explosives and all this stuff, you know, we're going to be fine. It amounts to a hill of beans against these aliens. They might as well have gone in there with sticks and stones. And I love that. I love that. So yeah, this was a good film. I still enjoy it. Every watch, I find something new. And um, tonight I want, I learned something in trivia and I wanted to test it myself. And when Bishop is telling them that, that uh, generator is going to explode in 40 minutes. There's exactly 40 minutes left in the film. Or oh, no, shit. no, there's exactly 50 minutes left in the film. The ten, the last 10 minutes is the queen fight on the Soloco, but there's only 40 minutes left of them on the planet. They get off the planet in 40 minutes in real time from the moment Bishop says that generator is going to dr- blow in 40 minutes or something like that. Yeah. Damn, JC. Yeah. So that's like really good attention to detail right there. Same with like when uh, Ripley gets on the elevator and the, the, the automated voice says there's only 14 minutes until explosion. That the whole sequence of her going down to the queen's chamber and all that. It's all 14 minutes. Damn. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. I'll share some more of my thoughts when we get into the group discussion. But uh, Josh, what about you? Well, you know, it isn't surprising in our Lord and Savior, James Cameron. <laughs> 
what would JC do? And that is just make a great film. That's that's what he would do. No matter how many crewmen he would have to berate and beat and traumatize. By God, this movie's going to get made by force. <laughs> the beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> it's been a minute since I've seen this movie, and I've got to say that it still lives up to my expectations. It was a lot of fun. It's like you said, the attention to detail. That one scene when the uh, their APC unit was driving into the uh, factory thing. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Most people, it would just be like, whatever. They would cut a hole. But no, James Cameron made it to where the turret on top rotated and folded back behind it. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of neat. Something like that would just be kind of like hand waved away or they would just make it a little taller so it could drive underneath. But that kind of tells you that like there's a standard size for all of these uh these openings. So it's like, we've got to do this, but we also got to build it to where it has the weapons aspect. But we got to make it be able to go into stuff like this because this is a standard company size or something i love that small shit that he does in there i'm sure if you went and you started looking at other uh, smaller aspects about it you would see just small little bits like that because i know i've mentioned the boxes in avatar before and how he like they made sure that like the small areas the boxes handles wouldn't be protruding too far out so that the boxes could be carried between doorways and in avatar Mm -hmm. james cameron's just so good about attention to detail like that I got to go back to what I said in my expectations about how the story is fairly simple. You know, Marines land on a planet. They get fucked up. They got to get off the planet. It's simple story. But what made it good was the element of storytelling. And I just I still got to stick by that. I do see some of your criticisms on set design, Tom. But I think some of the limitations was limitations of the 80s. I think they did a really good job of making the planet seem alien. Mm-hmm. Some of the flying effects was kind of sub or was kind of mediocre, but but overall, I gotta say this is I agree, solid nine out of ten, fantastic movie. The alien itself, you know, all the practical effects of the alien, they just they just did a great job with it. Oh yeah, that queen, oh my god, the fact oh, that, yeah, that, just... that was all practical and puppetry, and that was great because you know, no, they made that movie today. They just well, they have you know, like the queen and alien versus predator and all that. That CG, so yeah, just CG. Yeah, but oh, that one scene where they're like, oh, they should, they're, they're six meters away. They can't be. They're in the room. Yeah. They don't tell you. They're in the rafters. They all kind of just like looked up. Yeah. And then <laughs> as everybody in the audience was figuring it out too. And then they just like moved it stuff over and popped their heads up. Jesus Christ. Oh, First my time God. I saw that, I shit my pants. Like fucking cockroaches. Yeah, he does such a good job in this film of making the aliens scary in the face of these badass Marines. It's just Mm -hmm. really good direction. That's why I love this film so much. Um, I will say this, though, the criticisms of the the sets, Tom, like you were saying, you could tell the rocks were plastic and with spray paint on them. That's a product of the fact that we're watching it in HD now. HD shows up more of those flaws and it probably would have shown back in 1986 when we were, if you watched it in standard video. That's a good um, point. Yeah, that does show up in HD a lot more. But that being said, I mean, the movie was made in 1986. If that movie was made today and it looked like that, I'd be like, Jesus, dude, did you even <laughs> try? You yeah. know, but I mean, it was made in 1986. I'm not going to hold it against them too much. But yeah. yeah, like the flying effects were good for 1986. They would be bad for 2021. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if a movie that came out good in the art of war, though, no. yeah, yeah. That, that was a film made in 2000 and looked worse than this film. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm assuming, Josh, do you have any more thoughts or are we? Oh, uh, no, that was uh, that was my transition to the group thoughts. Oh, OK. Yeah. So I do have some nitpicks with the story, too. And I think it's it stems from them doing a lot of things to shoot themselves in the leg. You you noted, Josh, the the detail of the tank turret having to go behind it so it could fit in. That was also a subtle way of them removing the big gun as an option to take out the aliens. Because mm. it, it, that progressed as it went. I, I like that because that was a clever way of doing it. It's like, well, this this tank's got a big cannon. They could use that. No, they can't. It's behind them now. It's the only way to fit in. So that was a clever way, but them having to do that whole like, oh, if they sh- explode the vents, they'll blow this whole thing up. Well, give this one guy all your ammo. That, that was dumb. Barry, that was dumb. But that was something that like, Dan said it was realistic in terms of an unexperienced officer, inexperienced officer, making a rash, stupid decision. Really stupid decision. But I would be nitpicking that scene more if Gorman hadn't already been established as a rookie officer 
that was brand new to the job. And then like when they said like, you know, how many combat drops have you been in uh, Two, counting this one? Like they establish early on that he's green. He's a lot greener than the other ones. And I I'm okay with, with that. Like, I, I agree. That's a stupid decision, but it's not like they all collectively made that decision. He made that decision. And because he was the guy in charge, it was stupid. Like you see Apone when he when he first tells him to do that. Apone like tries to protest it. And he goes, "No, just do it, Sergeant." Yeah, and but some of those the officers should have known better. And the whole give all your ammo to one guy. It's one thing to say like holster your ammo, use only these rounds. That's one thing. But then to give them to one single guy that's not just dumb that's dumb tom also keep in mind in the context of the uh movie they'd only seen what these things can do they hadn't actually fought up against them and then even then i would imagine that half of them didn't know what they were even going up against they knew they were up against aliens that had totaled the colony yeah but yeah you're thinking we're marines these were fucking colonists of course they're gonna lose i mean the majority of them were professionals and they should have been like, no, that's dumb. We'll holster, but to give them to one person. Because right now we're arguing like why they could have, would have, should have, when really that's bad writing. Yeah, it, it does. It does smack of the script said so. Yeah. Not necessarily. Keep in mind, the highest ranking person in here was Apone. Everybody else was technically junior enlisted. Apone should have known better. But again, he this is one should of have, But at the same time, he was listening to his uh, officer's orders. I think... Most of those people were corporals. That's E4s. I mean, they were older here, but those are like 20 or younger typically for uh, in age groups. Yeah. Like, it, very rarely are they that old, are they much older. Yeah. Like I said, it was a really dumb thing to do, but it was a dumb decision established by an already dumb character who was established as a dumb character. Yeah, they were uh, so, definitely. It was if, I'm not arguing that it wasn't a dumb decision, but mm-hmm. I'm saying in the context of who they were, it uh, kind of makes sense. Yeah, in the universe it does. Yeah, in the universe it makes sense. And on top of that, think about it this way. They probably didn't send the most uh, experienced uh, Marine crew out either. Yeah, well, was it was probably... also, a, it was kind of sort of hinted at that Burke set this whole thing up so that they could get specimens for transport back. So they probably sent a green officer because he wouldn't question things and make dumb decisions and get a lot of people killed that they don't mm-hmm. have to worry about getting home. So, I don't know. It's just, I, it, it, we're honestly splitting a hair. A over yeah, a, yeah, a yeah, really yeah. good this, movie. Yeah. We're really, we're really yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, this we're is looking not... for something to nitpick on it. Man, yeah, this... it was, yeah, it was one of those things. It was a dumb decision that was kind of a plot device. But I think that in the context of the movie, it was a good plot device. Yeah. You needed something to do that. Because if they would have set it off, you wouldn't have had, or if they would have set something off, which probably would have happened, they would have, uh, not, the rest of the movie wouldn't have happened. No, you're you're not wrong. Neither of you are wrong. This is me. I had something stuck in my teeth, and I just have to mm, poke at it till it gets out. It, it smacks of um, your uh, boss is giving you a really good evaluation, and you think, "Oh, cool, man! My my yearly eval is really good." And another thing, uh, and then it's like they they find like one tiny little thing to nitpick. Yeah, the mm-hmm. one email you sent in March. Um, yeah, you yeah. you copied the wrong people. And you're telling me this now. <laughs> you didn't have your shirt tucked in your first day. So yeah. We're going to have to deny your bonus. Exactly. We've all agreed that this is a great film. It was a good film, but we're like, eh, but mm. eh, that officer sure was stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like, I feel like this movie is like, if you was to break it down into story setting, acting, like a lot of movies, you'll have all the 10 in this category, 10 in this category, but like a three in this category and a five in this category. Mm-hmm. I feel like, this movie is a solid nine across the board. I'd say an eight in a few places. The story was very simple, like you said, Josh. It says, we got to go in to check on these colonists, and then things get worse from there. Progressively, yeah. progressively, progressively. Like, if you're just doing the you know the averages, if, you're, if you pick all the things out... It's like if you have a ten and a one, that's going to average to a five. Like it's just all of the high, all of them are going to be very high, like eights to tens. Yeah, I, I just feel like we're splitting hairs on that. Yeah, yeah. That, I'm moving past the whole officer thing. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm just yeah. saying, like this movie was solid. Um, I love the interactions between the Marines too. Yeah, yeah, you definitely felt like they were jarheads for sure. Although, um, was it Paxson who kept saying game over, man, game yeah. over? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. His performance was kind of a little grating. 
I think he was supposed to be because you keep in mind he was a private. So, in you know context of uh, military, a private's probably going to be somebody fresh out of high school. Mm-hmm, Granted, mm-hmm. Paxson was probably forty-one when he filmed this one. <laughs> <laughs> ageless wonder yeah we established that they age faster in this time frame because her daughter died when she was what 60 and the picture she looked like she was 99 yeah space space does a hell of a thing to you yeah clearly. that's actually because that picture was at the, uh sigourney weaver's actual mother no shit sorry miss sigourney weaver we don't mean to insult your mom direct your hate at tom but paxton was 31 years old when he filmed this movie yeah, but I think his practice. character was supposed to be grading, and he's he's he was he definitely I'm, was. I'm not gonna lie, even though he's a trained marine, he's also a private, and I absolutely would be freaking out at that situation as well. Especially if everything's going wrong, that can go wrong. Like, okay, all right, I made it out of the boiler room. I'm okay. I'm on the APC. Oh shit, they're attacking the APC. Okay, we finally got out of the APC. We're fine. Ah, here comes the drop ship. Good old drop ship. Going home. The drop ship's crashing. Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> fuck it. I'm done. This yeah. is the part where you throw the controller across the room. You're like, fuck you. I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. And then like the his reaction when she's like, Well, Newt survived with uh no training and for a lot longer than that. He I, he had the same reaction I would have had in that situation. Then fucking put her in charge. I don't care. We're none of us are getting out of this alive. Yeah. Yeah. How did you feel about the last half where it's like she's got to go back in to get Newt to get back out? How did you guys feel about that? Oh, I thought that was great. I actually really liked that about Ripley's character because if it, she lost her daughter and she kind of formed this bond with Newt. And I can totally see her, especially as a motherly figure, literally willing to go into hell to get her daughter out of there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had no problems with it whatsoever. I thought it was a great touch to her character. Yep. Because throughout the movie, Ripley wasn't showing particular bravery. More like survival. Yeah, she was a survival. She didn't want to go there. She was very hesitant to do really anything. So she was very much a uh, protect the people, but get the fuck out, you know? Yeah, and then like when they do get out of the um, out of the boiler room or whatever you want to call it at the beginning, when they all get killed, when most of the Marines get killed and they, they hunker back in that command station, she's definitely in survival mode. She's like hunker down and wait for rescue. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, she's you definitely know. not a Mary Sue in this one. That's for damn sure. Oh, and I no, think no. at that point, it kind of shows the uh, growth of the two characters. You could tell that at that point, you know, Ripley would have gone through hell to get that girl. Oh, yeah. literally she did. Uh, yeah. My grievance with it is that I think the initial set piece when they're going in was too much. They had freaking lightning bolts going everywhere and just needless pipes and such. Once she went downstairs and into hell itself, that looked good. That was like, fuck this. She's dead. She is going to die down here in hell. But the outer area was all wide and just, it was almost too much. Like uh, the blue lightning. Yeah. I can see your argument on that, but I honestly think that was just limitations of the time. Okay. But, uh, yeah, yeah like, but I kind of would... see what Tom's saying when they when they first fly into that room and it, it's got the lightning and it's already kind of on fire and all this stuff. It's almost too much to tell the audience danger. Will Robinson danger. It's like yeah. you could have been a little more subtle. I can see where Tom's saying, but again, I think we're splitting hairs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we are. We're definitely splitting hairs on that that scene. Tom just no, can't that's... give anyone an A. It has well, to come yeah. with it has to come with a butt. Tom is that boss. Oh my god. <laughs> hey, I th- I think Cameron for his third film he's ever made. I think he did well, but there is room for improvement. I'm going to give him a B minus. <laughs> what was it? Michael Crichton, he uh he was in a creative writing class and he felt like his teacher was being unfair. I forget the story that he submitted, but it was by like a really famous author. Mm-hmm. He turned it in and uh under his name, you know, total plagiarism, but um, he turned it in and got a C plus. <laughs> Tom, Tom's like, I just found my spirit animal, Michael Crichton's English teacher. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I'd say, but I've I've said my thoughts again for his third film and only his second blockbuster ever. Yeah, not bad, Cameron. Not bad at all. I'd have to say I will watch this movie again when I get a chance. Hopefully I can see it in theaters because this definitely would benefit from a big screen watch. Oh, it definitely. Does. This one and the thing I would love to watch in theaters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd go see this again in the theater tonight. In a heartbeat. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah like, 
Hell, even even though we just watched it now, if I found out there was a showing tomorrow, I'd go see it. Like I mm-hmm. just, yeah. I'd love to go see it in theaters, you know. And it's simple. It's fun. It's simply fun. That's why I said I think the James Cameron magic comes from his art of storytelling. I think just everything is solid in his movies. Mm-hmm. Like not everything is perfect, but everything is solid. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know? that's a good point. Yeah, not his best film, but definitely pretty darn solid. No, no, I would say that his best film is coming up here soon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think his best film is coming up here very soon. Titanic. Woo! <laughs> oh, I was thinking The Abyss. Oh, man, I was going to go Avatar. Actually, you guys, we're all wrong. We all It's True Lies. Come it's on. It's True Lies. God, true what are lies, we thinking? True Lies is amazing. No, it no, really we're is. all wrong. We're all wrong. It's Piranha 2. It's Piranha 2. It is Piranha 2. <laughs> How wrong we were. Forgive us. James Kim. <laughs> and that's tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please like and subscribe on whatever medium you choose. We really appreciate it as it really helps us out. Also, when you do listen to our podcast, be sure to give us a review. Give it that five stars, that thumbs up, that smiley face, whatever. And just say what you thought of the episode or episodes, what parts you liked, what parts you really liked. No creative criticisms. We're, we're, our egos are very fragile. I don't think mm-hmm. we could handle any sorts of critiques. But any sorts of praise, we're all for that. So do what you can, when you can, however you can do it. And uh, stop what you're doing. I want you to stop it right now. I want you to go op- open up your web browser and go to discord.me slash fire pit. And then I want you to log in and join our discord server. And I want you to tell us what you thought about the episode and why you think Tom is wrong. Okay. I want you to go ahead and just do it. Just post it in our general chat room. We want to talk about it. Also bonus. If you join our discord servers, you'll get notifications. You'll get to talk with us, the hosts, the people you love and how two thirds of our opinions are awesome. Um, but you can also talk about older episodes, um, future episodes, uh, and, you know, various whatnots. So uh, we look forward to talking with you, and uh, we'll see you there. And if you want to email Tom about why he's wrong and why he nitpicks and only gives out B pluses and never A's, you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's mentioned back in the interspersal by the same guy who won't give passing grades. So... <laughs> But uh, send us a long message, a short message. Send Tom a long message, a short message, a happy message, a sad message. It don't matter. It don't matter. Tom's the one reading them, not me or Josh. It's fine. It's fine. Seriously, direct your hate. Um, (laughs) (laughs) In all seriousness, no, uh, we all read it. We all appreciate it. Um, And also be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter at FirePitCCE. Uh, both are linked in the episode's description as well at FirePit.Podbean.com. And I'd like to start by giving a shout out to Greyhound Bus, under which my uh, two friends have just thrown me. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys. Love, love, love it under this bus. We love guys. you, Tom. We love you. We love uh, you. You say as you shove me further under the bus. Uh Thank you. Uh, but I would like to shout out two of our Facebook followers, Young and Hobbs, two of our latest additions uh, out of the hundreds and growing that we are getting uh, daily, weekly, and monthly. Thank you for popping in, whether you show up just to see us post new things or your regular listeners, the occasional listeners. Just like having something pop up on your news feed every Thursday, whatever it is, we appreciate your time and for keeping the fire pits burning. I would also like to shout out Audacity. Audacity is the software which I utilize to edit this podcast. It is free software, so we're not paying them a dime and they are not paying us a dime to shout them out but it has been with us since the beginning i use it to take all of these words that we say all of these opinions especially my very right opinions about this movie and i make them sound so amazing so you can have an amazing listening experience so to that i say thank you audacity 
If you get a chance, I say use it for your own podcast or for whatever you want. And I feel like there's another shout out I need usually make. No, you're done. You're done. <laughs> Love you, Tom. Wow, just deeper <laughs> under this bus. Wow. Now back up and go over again. <laughs> Get it right this time. <laughs> um, I'd like to shout out my wife for um, putting up with me and uh, working around our schedule. Additionally, I'd like to shout out my parents. My mom um, felt like that I slighted her in one of our earlier episodes. It wasn't. It was unintentional if you took it that way, mother. I love you. And my dad, obviously. I love you guys both. Also, I'd like to shout out Sync Lounge and Plex for hosting our movie watching experience tonight and not having any major uh, technical difficulties tonight. All of that was on our, our computers and our mics tonight. Yeah. But they were obviously remedied. So mm-hmm. thank you, as always. And uh, I would like to shout out Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Always appreciate your feedback and uh, your listening and your support. Also shouting out all my work friends who listen to the show and give me some feedback on the show and even um, sometimes repeat my catchphrases back to me. That's always <laughs> fun. And a special shout out to Zencaster, a recording platform for the podcast. Once again, technical difficulties, microphone difficulties, slight recording difficulties. Doesn't matter. Zencaster saved it all, uploaded it without a problem. And our editor thanks you. Again, it's a free service uh, we use. They are not paying us to talk about them and uh, we don't pay them to use it. But it's just such good software that we just can't help but uh, shout it out. Fantastic. So uh, next week. Like this is the we didn't we haven't said this word yet the penultimate point on our journey isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that means next week's the big destination film, isn't it, boys? It dun, is. Dun 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 dun. dun. It's just uh, something about a highway road. No fate, but what you make it. Easy money. I'll have what she's having. I um not that film. Oh. Join us next week as we reach our destination film, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, following James Cameron in the director's chair to what is probably his best film. Uh, We can't wait to watch it, and we can't wait to have you guys listen to the episode. Jesus Christ, is that already this destination film, guys? Yes. Yep. Episode 76. Holy fuck. We're 25 away from episode 100. Yep. Didn't we just hit episode 50 like 20 minutes ago? (laughs) Feels like it, doesn't it? Yeah. Whew. Tune in next week for episode 76 and a run down to episode 100. Until next time, I've been Tom. I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. <laughs>
needs yeah. to go to school. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. No need to think on that further. Oh, Jesus Christ. For fuck's sake. <laughs> This is why I joined the Space Marines.